Now, before we get to the heart of the matter, let me just touch on this really quickly. In 2017, we have one goal of the program. That's to hashtag make wrestling fun again. We need it. Who needs it? You, you, you! All us! we got to make wrestling fun again, and we can do it. And I'm here to lead the way. And one of the ways that you can help is to hashtag subscribe or die to this channel. You know you want to. You may not want to. But either way, it feels like you almost have to. So click that subscribe button. Now let's get right into talking about this week's Raw. Because I enjoyed quite a bit of this show. You kick off right away. Roman Reigns. And just as you're thinking, oh, God, we're going to start off with a long, drawn-out, big dog promo. Here comes the ambulance, and here comes Braun Strowman. Braun! Looking like a combination of my roided-up Uncle Udo, and as some people would say, a Care Bear. This segment was awesome. Great fucking way to start this show. Lasted less than ten minutes, got the point across. Now, we didn't see Roman the la rest of the night. We didn't have to see Braun the rest of the night. Get in, get out, and get on your way. Which is what most guys like to think that their sex life could be. Ten minutes or less! That's all they need. If you can't get yours, that's your problem. Moving on, though, awesome way to kick off the show. And and just heading into this show, I hadn't been this excited for Raw in quite a while. Quite a while. And there's one reason for that, but we'll get to that. But the way this show started off only helped me. And then we go right into a six-man tag, and... Stop cutting off Elias Sampson's song, damn it. WWE, that is the one way that he is guaranteed to get over. That's the one way he is guaranteed to get some damn heat. It is the attraction for him. So I, I, why in the hell would you have him wrestle and do all this other crap? The only thing he should, frankly should be doing right now is singing his damn song. But if you are going to insist on being morons and having him wrestle, then what you need to do is let him have his song play out. Because we can't have Elias Sampson do his bit, but we can give a full entrance to fucking Finn Balor. And speaking of Finn Balor, honestly, seriously, when are people going to realize that this dude sucks? I'm just saying. Because he does. And one way or another, eventually, you'll start coming over to that side of the fence. Don't believe me? Look at how you feel now about Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and the like. And only the WWE would sit there and bring in the Hardys and get the awesomeness that was the moment of WrestleMania 33 where they were the most overact on the card to now where they've basically only utilized them in matches. We've got them basically wrestling against Sheamus and Cesaro freaking again. And we've made the Hardys just another tag team. Only the WWE could manage to accomplish that type of stupidity. For all the crap you would have given in Impact Wrestling over the years, and rightfully so, at least you know if they bring in an act like the Hardys, they're going to pound them left to right down your throat, straight up your ass. They're going to make them the biggest fucking deal they possibly can. WWE brings these guys back, and they're as hot as they've been in years in terms of their career, and you just make them some other jabronis. Period. I did also enjoy the Samoa Joe uh, prison shower creeping on Paul Heyman. Don't drop the soap! Don't drop the soap! Whatever you do, Lord Almighty, don't drop the soap. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because Joe's going to kill your asshole. Uh, but uh, speaking of assholes, all this build up for weeks and weeks and weeks to the inevitable face-off between Goldust and R-Truth. There's no little Jimmy. There's no blonde wig. And this segment was trash. What a complete epic waste of everybody's effing time. As so often is the case with WWE, it ultimately comes down to being a waste of time. This was one of the biggest wastes of time of the night. And you had literally spent weeks building up to this to the point where, even if people don't care anymore about Goldust and or our truth there was at least a little bit of intrigue to see what they were going to do. And this was the big shit sandwich they served up. But anyways, it didn't really matter because the only thing that really, truly, 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 truly mattered on this week's Raw was this Miz TV segment. And how appropriate it is that you're going to bring in the headline act of the night and pair him up on a TV segment on live television, Monday Night Raw, with the WWE's best superstar in the Miz. So you take the WWE's best superstar, 
You take a real talent in LeVar Ball, and I hope all the wrestlers, excuse me, sports entertainers in the back were watching and paying attention because, damn it, that's what an entertainer looks like. That's what a performer looks like. That's what a larger-than-life personality looks like. That's somebody that actually goes out of his way to try and get his shit over. Maybe some of y'all could actually take some notes and learn something from this. And, and while, yes, I'm aggravated because... You have a Titus O'Neil character that is clearly a parody, satire, and ripoff of LeVar Ball, but you don't involve Titus and his Titus brand anywhere in this segment. That's annoying. And yes, LeVar should have come out in part and been trying to steal Maurice. He should have been stealing the Mrs. Bitch when all was said and done. He should have at least been trying to, if anything else. And Dean Ambrose did his best, as he always does, to fucking ruin everything. This shit was Epic! Epic! This, ladies and gentlemen, is what I was waiting for. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why the WWE needed LeVar Ball on Raw, and furthermore, they need him at WrestleMania next year. I don't give a crap what you say. If you think it was, it was great like I did and enjoyed the hell out of it, and you thought it was a train wreck, train wrecks can still be good. From a train wreck standpoint, this would also be incredibly entertaining. Instead of the WWE really choosing to write out and plan a great segment or doing some backstage pre-tape stuff, they said, we're just going to give LeVar Ball a hot mic. What could possibly fucking go wrong here? Beat that crack of ass! Beat that crack of ass! Well, that's not what the youngest ball kid said. You know what he said. I'm not about to say it and get the flaming keyboard fingers of fire going a-blazing in the comments section. But holy hell, LeVar Ball was epic. This whole shit was epic. And when you look at his big 6'6 six, six ass, he sits there and disrobes his shirt. You're like, Jesus Christ. He looks like he could have a go, even at his late 40s, early 50s age, at most of the fucking roster. Which is epic and awesome for LeVar Ball, and also an indication of just how crappy some elements of WWE are today. But I love this fucking segment. You're not going to convince me that it wasn't great. You're not going to be able to ruin this for me. You can't do it. If you didn't enjoy it, fine. But you're missing out. You're missing out. Unless you watch the NBA Awards and you saw Bill Russell say he could kick all of their asses. Now that, if you watched it instead, I get it. I understand it. But then we follow right up into a six-man tag where if we're going to go live, Mike, and we're going to get nuts, let's get nuts. Let's have LeVar Ball do live commentary on the microphone for the whole arena, Abraham Saddam Washington style. That's what the hell we should have done here. But instead, we had the six-man tag that, of course, because they had Dean Ambrose, they do their best to try and ruin every fucking thing. But Miz wins, and everybody celebrates. This was great. The Enzo big cast segment... I will say this, the WWE is trying, they're really, really trying, and Enzo was really, really good once he got on the mic and got serious. What I don't understand is, your best friend of years has just stabbed you in the back, so you're coming out in your entrance and you're jumping up and down and you're doing the same shtick, who the fuck would do that? That's where the problem comes in, in terms of the lack of ability to connect and relate to these characters. My best friend stabs me in the back and does the shit that he did to me previously and that last week on Raw. I'm not celebrating. I'm probably coming out there with my fucking peace, if you know what I mean. And this dude's fucking out there celebrating and doing all this certified G dance bullshit. Well, once you get past that, Enzo was outstanding. Frankly, I thought Cass was pretty good here, too. Trying to get that hashtag White Roman label uh, to stick to cast, but it, it may or may not work. Um, but this was good, and I love the way that they went all the way with really trying to tease that these guys were actually back together just to get the, oh, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm still pissed that they broke these guys up because they had so much mileage left. They didn't even give them a shot at the tag titles. They didn't even give them a run with the tag titles. They didn't give them a program with the Hardys. There were things they still could have done they could have done it, and they didn't do it. I understand in part maybe why they wanted to do it, but I thought it was way, way, way too soon. You just didn't have to go there. And if you don't have to go there, why do it? Segment was really good, though. I just find myself not caring very much about it. So it can be good, and I don't care. And this is one of those examples. 
Thankfully, soon after this, uh, Seth Rollins came out, which was my indication that I could go take a piss and I could go take the dogs out for a walk because, frankly, I knew eventually he was going to squash Kurt Hawkins and Bray Wyatt was going to come on the Titantron like he always does and cut some stupid bullshit promo that nobody gives a fuck about. And, frankly, when it comes to Bray Wyatt at this point, if he's not coming out as Bray Offerman, I don't care. If JoJo Wyatt, Bray Offerman, if it's not that, I don't care. Seth Rollins versus Bray Wyatt, I most certainly don't fucking care. And if you think about these two guys three years ago, envisioning where they could have been, you would have been thinking of them as two of the top four to six guys in the company. And these would be the guys that most people would be behind. These would be the guys that most people would be cheering for. Now you're just apathetic towards both of them. Only WWE, because after all, hashtag WWE ruins everything. Hashtag WWE ruins everybody, or they try to at least. Uh, eventually, one of the themes throughout the night was that Paul Heyman was going to bring out Brock Lesnar, and Brock Lesnar was coming for a fight with Samoa Joe, and I love the way they did this. I thought Paul Heyman, even though a lot of times, granted, the stuff he says on the mic is pretty repetitive, we do get you know, some good stuff still out of them, and it really does a good job of hyping this up, even though I don't really know that you need Heyman to hype it up that much. Um, and WWE's been hitting some good marks here in terms of what they're doing with Joe and Lesnar, and they've really got me intrigued for this match at goodness gracious, great balls of fire! Beat that crack of ass! Beat that crack of ass! <laughs> but having Joe come out from behind and get Brock Lesnar and have him start choking him and locking that coquina clutch and have him hold it and hold it and hold it, and Lesnar's trying to fight out of it, and he can't fight out of it, and he holds it and holds it. You know, what you've done right there is you've validated Samoa Joe and you said, if he locks this in Sunday, July 9th, it could be all she wrote. The Conqueror could indeed get conquered and we could have a new WWE Universal Champion. You, you could sit there and talk about heel-face dynamics. If you, you really don't need them in that case. This is supposed to feel like a big fight. Frankly, anything at this point in time that Lester's involved in needs to feel like a big fight. And as a result, these two guys going at it is feeling more and more to me like a big fight. This was another real highlight segment of the show, and I love the fact that they made Joe look so freaking epically strong here. So epically strong. And I'm glad I got some of the good that I did, because they saved this number one contender's Divas Gauntlet match for the end of the night. And good Christ almighty, who in the bluest of blue fucks decided that they were going to give this shit a half hour. Who in the hell decided that they were going to main event this? Well, to be fair, they figured everybody's tuning out on the third hour anyways, so they might as well put the crap they care about the least on last, which would be the women. Sorry, it's true. But you're looking at this. Bailey gets out there first. Thanks for playing, Bailey. Bye, bitch. You need to be off TV a little while. And it's amazing, too, isn't it? How quickly WWE took this wannabe babyface that, to me, was always a heel but had the people behind her to now they're savaging her and they can't stand her and they realize that she sucks and now you need to either flip her character or you need to have her go the hell away. It's amazing how quickly that turned. That quickly. Based off of one horrible TV segment where the champion gets all scot-free and it all is based off of Bailey and it's all bashing Bailey. But that's not all in this match. You get another example of bringing somebody in and underutilizing them. You bring back Mickey James and you squander her. Why are you bringing these people back if you're not going to utilize them and get the most out of them? That makes no sense. Now we got to throw Dana Brooke in there because it's div this Divas match, this women's match. It's got to be like Kelly Kelly. Everybody's got to get a fucking turn, if you know what I mean. Bitch, please, Dana Brooke. Face plant. Emma, how's that being a wrestler going for you, bitch? So stupid. Fucking dumbass. She deserves whatever the hell she gets. I don't care if you want to defend how good she is in the ring. Not everybody needs to be a wrestler. Some people get over better because they're not a wrestler. See Lana as one of many notable recent examples. But this whole match, you're sitting there and you're saying, uh, Nia Jax. You know, like, oh my god. She might actually do it. She's squashing all these bitches. I mean, she's rolling through these white girls like she's LeVar Ball. I mean, she's just obliterating and destroying white puss all over the place. And then here comes bald-headed Sasha Banks. You spend a half hour building up Nia Jax into this big fucking monster just to sit there and have 
her go several minutes with Sasha Banks, and she ultimately gets choked out, tapped out, and submits. Who does that? Who in the bluest of blue fucks thinks that that is a good idea? Who in the hell thinks that is any type of way to build up a monster? It doesn't matter that she squashed the four other white heifers first. When Sasha Banks got in there, everybody's just going to remember that she tapped out again. You don't have monsters tap out like this. So that way, what? We can sit there and have Sasha Banks get yet another title shot, this time against Alexa Bliss? We've had that. We need to get past that. We need to get over that. We need to do something different. Whether people like Nia Jax or not doesn't matter to me. I thought she showed herself pretty well in this match, especially as it went along. Why not get some different blood in there? There's actually more story there with her and Alexa than to, there is to me with Sasha and Alexa. But I don't know. I don't know. Who the hell thinks it's a good idea to have a monster go a half hour and then tap out? That's fucking dumb. But anyways, you know, even with that, a lot of good happened on this show. Roman Strowman segment was awesome. Miz TV with LeVar Ball was incredible. Beat that crack of ass! Beat that crack of ass! The Enzo Cast segment was good, even if I don't care much about it. There was a well-placed Seth Rollins, Bray Offerman, piss break in there. Brock and Samoa Joe was really, really good. It wasn't a perfect show, and it had its moments uh, where it kind of drug on a little bit. But I thought the segments that needed to deliver delivered pretty well here. And it kind of somewhat validated why I was so excited for this week's Raw. I ended up feeling really, really entertained. And I feel kind of odd and almost borderline dirty saying that. I do. So anyways, this has been the Schlag Daddy here on OTR Essential. And remember, with OTR Essential, it's not the wrestling show you want. It's the wrestling show you need. Bye, everybody. Remember, subscribe to die, bitches! Subscribe to die!